Welcome back. In the last video, we were talking about how we can use uncertainty analyses to identify uh, the dominant sources of uncertainty affecting our model predictions, uh, and use that to try to uh, target uh, more efficient field sampling, more efficient data collection in order to constrain our models more efficiently and reduce our prediction, reduce our uncertainties in our predictions and basically improve our predictability. So uh, in this section, I want to kind of build on that and say, how do you actually do that? And how do you know how much data you need uh, for any particular analysis? So kind of our, some of our classic power analyses, questions, uh, what sample size do I need to detect a given effect size? And what is the minimal effect size detectable given some sample size? So if, I've, if I have the number of samples that I have, what's the effect size that I can detect? And if I'm designing a study, if I want to you know, detect effects of some given size, how much samples do I need? And I'll give you the, the, the reality out there is you know, far too often people are doing this uh, by, the, by intuition in the seat of their pants and resulting in uh, underpowered studies, studies that do not have enough samples to actually detect the effects that, that uh, the researchers are interested in. Uh, building on this more com in a more complex way, uh, we can think about observational design studies that help us better identify uh, what we need to measure, uh, where we need to measure it, and how do we gain this new insight most efficiently. So it kind of builds on this idea of power analysis to, to kind of do at a higher level, often dealing with whole designing whole networks or designing sensors is sort of thing that happens when uh, one is just deploying a sensor network or designing a new sensor to kind of understand uh, what is what are the design constraints. Okay, so to, to get our heads around this idea, it's useful to come back and think about what power actually is. And to do that, let's consider just a simple uh, hypothesis test between some null hypothesis and some alternative hypothesis. And so our idea of uh, p-values of tests for significance are based on this alpha part here, this pink shaded part, which says uh, if the alternative, if the null hypothesis is true, what's the probability of generating uh, values at or more extreme than a threshold under that uh, null model? And so essentially, p-values are about controlling your rate of false positives. So how often would you get a positive result even if nothing is happening? So they assume the null model is true and ask how often uh, you would get a value equal at or equal to that threshold value. And so, uh, you know, if this is set up with a... a, a, a 5% alpha, then you have 2.5% in each of these tails, and you set these thresholds, and uh, when values exceed those thresholds, you call that you know, significant. Um, by contrast, we can also look at this from the perspective of the alternative hypothesis and ask the question, uh, if, that is, if the alternative hypothesis is true, how often do we reject the alternative hypothesis? So this betas would be false negatives. So cases where uh, the alternative hypothesis is true, but we still generate observations that are below that threshold of significance. And so if beta is our rate of false negatives, power is one minus beta. So it's how often do we accept the alternative hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true. So if the alternative hypothesis is true, how often do we accept it? Uh, and so power is going to end up being a function of two things. Uh, the effect size, you know, how kind of basically where this alternative hypothesis lies in terms of its mean, uh, and the uncertainty or variability around that alternative hypothesis. So you can imagine uh, if this effect size was larger, you'd have more power. And if the standard error was narrower, 
we'd have more power. So we have high power when we're trying to detect effect, large effect sizes, and we have high confidence about our estimates. Uh, the effect sizes are usually uh, determined by nature itself. We don't get to control that. That's, you know, uh, what we do get to control is that standard error because that's going to be controlled by our sample size uh, and, and the inherent variability in systems, but also uh, it's the sort of thing that can always be squeezed down with more samples. So that does tell us that uh, for a given amount of data, uh, you know, our threshold or, you know, our power is going to be higher for large effect sizes and smaller, uh, lower power for small effect sizes. Uh, so the, in this figure, the figure on the left is just the one that we uh, read, similar drawing to what we just saw. And the figure on the right is trying to look at um, how power varies with effect size and uncertainty. And so again, for this simple, uh, you know, null and alternative hypothesis case. So the effect sizes are on the x-axis, power is on the y-axis, and each of these contours is a contour of a different level of, of standard error. And so if you are interested in your a specific value of power, so say you want a 90% chance of uh, detecting uh, an effect when it is true, uh, then, you know, if you're, uh, you can kind of say, you can kind of cut across there and say, well, if the, if sigma is 0.75, then, you know, I'll be able to detect, you know, effects of, you know, uh, you know, but three quarters or bigger, you know, and if, if it's 0.025, I can detect detect effects of, you know, a quarter or bigger. So you can kind of see, you know, uh, at a given level of power, how, uh, what effects you'll be able to detect for different levels of sigma. And again, sigma is the part you're going to have the most control over because sigma is the thing that is most influenced by sample size. And, and as you increase sample size, you will, you will tend to increase, decrease that sigma. And in fact, uh, for, there's this general tendency that these uncertainties in parameters are going to go down uh, asymptotically towards zero as we get larger and larger sample size, and they tend to go down in proportion to one over the, the square root of n. And in fact, if you're just fitting a simple mean, you know, our standard of error is our standard deviation divided by the square root of n, uh, and this tendency to decline asymptotically with more data towards zero is going to be true in the more general sense. And so if I want to be able to uh, increase power, I want to be able to ramp that down so I can work backwards. So if I uh, find, you know, if I'm here and I say, I think I'm interested in detecting effects that are smaller than one with 90% probability, I can come up and say, you know, what uh, level of sigma do I need to achieve that? And then I can then come over here and say, uh, you know, for that sigma, you know, let's say it was 0.2, you know, what is the sample size that I need to get to that uh, 0.2? Now, this curve is is not a general curve. This curve is dependent upon what uh, that actual standard deviation is. And so where you're starting from initially has a lot to do with how quickly you're, uh, within here, you know, higher inherent variability, you'll need more samples. But the general idea is that you can relate your sample size. If you have an estimate of the variability in a system, uh, initially you can, which you often have if you have preliminary data, you can then estimate how many more samples you need to detect certain effect sizes at certain powers. And for simple things like uh, fitting means and fitting regressions, these sorts of uh, power statistics are, are, are known. They're, they have analytical equations behind them. And there's R packages that can uh, calculate them. So, for example, we spent a lot in this class, a lot of time in this class, thinking about regression. And so, here for a univariate regression, if I am interested in uh, being able to detect effect sizes down to an R squared of 10%, uh, R squared is a good measure of effect size on regression. And that's a you know you, you 
pretty common thing that you would think like if, if something is explaining 10% of the variability, I would like to be able to detect that. If it's explaining 1% or half percent, I might be okay not knowing that. Uh, but I sure as heck wouldn't want to be missing things that are on the, you know, 20, 25, 15% and just not detecting them because I don't have enough samples. So if, if I set that as a, as a threshold of power of, of effect size, this curve tells me the relationship between how, uh, how the power is going to change as the sample size changes. So I want to have a very, uh, small number of samples, just a handful, I have very low power. So uh, if I have a handful of samples, I just will not, have a very low probability of actually detecting uh, R squares at this level. And then it go, you know, as the sample goes up, the power goes up. So, you know, you know 50 samples, I might be able, I might have a, a power of about 60%. So, uh, and that's a non-trivial number if you're collecting data by hand. You'll find lots of studies out there, uh, particularly older studies, and still some today where people are, uh, they have 50 data points in there uh, going out and, and fitting not just a regression, but sometimes filtering a multiple regression. And you're saying, well, for each of those, you know, just for one parameter, just detecting one slope, uh, would you go out and collect all that data for something that has a 60% chance of detecting your effect size, it's, it's not much better than a coin flip. Um, and in fact, to get your power up to 90%, which means when you do the study, there's a 90% chance of detecting the effects when they're real, uh, needs about 100 data points. And to me, that's, that's often a, a rule of thumb that I use uh, when reading papers. Uh, that use regression. If, if I'm just doing a univariate regression, only one X, uh, and I, you know, take this 10% R squared as a threshold of interest, you know, I, I need about 100 data points. And that, whenever I encounter sample studies that have less than 100 data points and are fitting a regression, I, I get worried about power. And if I want to get uh, up to 95%, you know, maybe I need, you know, more like 130. Uh, but then, you know, after that, it starts asymptoting quickly. The power goes up quite high. Um, and, you know, indeed, I'm going to be able to detect smaller effect sizes. And I'm also going to be able to move on to multiple regressions where, you know, to detect, uh, you know, two slopes, you know, in X1 and X2, I need even more power. Uh, so the power is also going to be a function of the number of covariates, because again, we're essentially dividing the information over multiple parameters. So I need, you know, if I have, you know, three, four, five parameters, I'm going to need, you know, three, four, 500 data points uh, to fit those size models. In fact, this figure uh, kind of does that. Uh, so here, uh, to be able to make these lines straight, I'm looking at both sample size and R squared on a log axis. And I'm making contours of, of power. So if I, uh, you know, have, you know, 100 samples and I'm fitting a univariate regression, uh, then I'll be able to detect things down to R squared of about point Oh, two, about 25% of the time, I'll be able to detect things down to, you know, point, uh, point oh five, you know, well, and between 50 and 75%. Uh, here's that point, uh, about a hundred samples gives me a power, uh, at a power of 90%. And then I'll be able to, to detect uh, things a little bit bigger than that at 95%. And so you can see there's this general trade-off, you know, that as uh, my sample size increases, my power always increases, my ability to detect smaller and smaller uh, effect sizes decreases. And then at the flip side, you know, when my sample sizes are low, uh, you know, my power, uh, detect these effects uh, can be quite limited. Um, 
in keeping with the general trend we've had in this class of, of not just sticking to uh, simple models and uh, analytical solutions, I also wanted to quickly discuss uh, the numerical solution for how you would kind of generate these sorts of curves uh, numerically. And we usually do it by some sort of pseudo data simulation. So, and this, this formula will look very familiar because it's basically the same thing we did for a bootstrap. So in a, like with a bootstrap, uh, we start by setting up a loop. We draw a sample of data of some size. We fit the model, we save the parameters, we see how well we did. Uh, for no non-parametric bootstrap, we're resampling the data. For a parametric bootstrap, we're assuming uh, a model and parameters and simulating the data. And the important difference uh, is that in a bootstrap, you are always setting the sample size, the sample size that you have, because you want to know the uncertainty you have right now. Uh, if you're doing this to understand power, you're going to want to be varying that sample size. So frequently you embed this loop in another overall loop uh, that varies uh, the sample size you're interested in or varies the effect size. So you might change the parameters uh, to ask, you know, could I detect you know, a slope of uh, 0.5? Could I detect a slope of you know, uh, 0.01 or maybe Similarly, I might, you know, vary. I might hold the parameters constant, uh, hold the sample size constant, but then vary the amount of uh, noise we add when we do our pseudo data simulation to kind of understand that trade-off. But essentially, we can set up these loops to explore uh, usually how sample size changes our ability to constrain the model, detect different parameters, detect different, get different parameters right. Um, and like we do in the bootstrap, we, you know, summarize this in terms of overall, uh, distributions and things like, you know, power numbers. So how often do we accept the, uh, alternative hypothesis when it's true? Uh, next thing I wanted to do is kind of link this back to, uh, what we were talking about earlier. So we kind of just discussed how, uh, as we vary sample size, our parameters get more and more constrained. That would come out of these sorts of analysis we talked about just now. So this might have uh, arrived through some sort of pseudo-data simulation where we might have started with, you know, maybe we had some pilot data and we had a standard error with that. And then we simulated if we had additional data, you know, how quickly we'd be able to reduce that uncertainty. But imagine that we were dealing not with just one simple hypothesis test, but maybe uh, a model that had multiple processes in it and multiple parameters. Uh, and I want to be able to compare among different parameters. Well, the thing I can do is I can, instead of thinking about this in terms of the uncertainty of each parameter, each parameter is different units. I can think about this in terms of what I actually care about, which is usually the model's predictions. Uh, so if I want to, uh, if I, translate everything into units of the model's predictions, uh, then I can compare across parameters. I mean, this is exactly what we did with the uncertainty analysis, partitioning the uncertainty contribution. So at a, at a given sample size, the contribution of different uh, parameters uh, to the overall predictive uncertainty. And so if I have this ability to compare parameters, you might look at this and go, oh, you know, I want to model measure variable two because that's going to give me the greatest return on investment. You know, even though uh, its uncertainty, its contribution to the overall uncertainty is a little bit lower uh, than variable one. You know, I don't necessarily just target variable one, even though it has a larger uncertainty contribution initially, uh, but because it's going to decline more slowly. By contrast, I can make the overall uncertainty go down in the model quicker by measuring more of variable two. Uh, but it turns out we can get even more sophisticated and we can actually um, apply a little bit of economic theory and ask the question of what should we sample as we uh, increase our sample size? And so here to do this next panel, uh, which combines the two variables together, I ask, ask the question, what gives me the best return on investment? So what 
drops the model uncertainty most per data point. And so what you would do is what initially is what I just described. You would sample variable two, this red curve, because that's giving you the most return on investment for sample size is dropping the uncertainty quickest. But that will start shallowing out. And at some point, in fact, it's after uh, six more samples, uh, the slope of this curve now is shallower than the, st the initial slope of uh, this other curve. And then we say we'd actually start measuring some of variable one. Then we go back to variable two and we measure more of variable one. And you actually get this uh, switching behavior. And now, so we can look at the overall model combined uncertainty from these two sources of uncertainty and how that goes down uh, as we sample different things. And in this case, showing what the kind of optimal design would be for a given uh, sample size, uh, what the relative number of the two samples would be. Now, this also makes an important assumption, which is these two parameters uh, cost us the same amount of time and effort which isn't always true. So here we see uh, this thing that gives you a, a lot of return on investment, probably something we haven't been able to measure a lot of before. Uh, maybe that was because that thing was more expensive to measure. So if we actually ascribe costs to each of these, we could actually uh, look at how our model uncertainty might change as our uh, cost of, of field sampling goes up in terms of you know money or man hours or number of sample sites or some other, any sort of measure of what it's costing us to do field work. Um, we could do this kind of through simulation, uh, making choices about, you know, what the optimal, uh, uh, optimal investment is. Cool. And so that's kind of leading us towards this idea of more complex uh, analyses of, of simulating different scenarios. And this leads us quite naturally into this idea of observing system simulation experiments, which is a mouthful, but basically means uh, kind of uh, a bootstrap on steroids, where you start by your ability to, to simulate your true system, uh, simulate observations from that system, uh, and then we assimilate our si simulated observations we fit our model to that data and assess the impact of on estimates, uh, often using more complex models and more complex uh, experimental design, such as uh, uh, kind of uh, building out networks, so where to add uh, locations, or exploring alternative uh, sensor designs. So if I simulated my true system and then uh, simulated different sensors that have different characteristics, it would change my ability to simulate, uh, to fit the model to those different data uh, given their different characteristics. And so this is the sort of thing that you will see being done uh, in places like NOAA where we uh, are interested in deploying weather satellites or NASA where we're deploying uh, satellite observations or in ocean buoy networks. Um, so this sort of idea when we were making larger investments in research infrastructure, uh, we can actually put some effort uh, at the beginning to understand what is our ability uh, to actually uh, constrain the models we're interested in using those types of data. Thanks, and that kind of wraps up where we were talking about in this section of uncertainty. So we, again, just to re refresh, we started with the question of sensitivities, how do our changes in X affect our Y? We translated that into uh, how the uncertainties in effect in X affect the uncertainties in Y. We then talked about of being able to identify the most important sources of uncertainty. And now we've talked about how we can design studies to reduce the most, reduce uncertainties to get us the most bang for our buck. Thanks.